Well, um, good morning, good morning, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome uh, here to the Bibliothek Solvay, the Solvay Library. It's a historical place. Um, we just saw uh, with, with Jean a little picture um, that was taken here uh, probably a hundred years ago, not quite, no, not quite, with a few personalities that I think all of us uh, remember from um, the physics books. Um, Mr. Mr. Einstein was here, Mr. Planck was here, Mr. Heisenberg was here, they were all sitting, I think probably uh, in front of this wall, um, and uh, discussing at the time chemistry questions for um, the, uh, the family Solvay, a big ch chemical uh, company um, based here in Belgium um, that um, is still actually uh, one of the world leaders in, in chemistry. So, so it's, a, it's a very nice and old building and so a very warm welcome. Welcome, welcome to you to uh, today's conference and today's um, uh, discussion. Um, our conference is entitled Global Partners for Global Challenges um, for a reason. I do think um, we are at a critical moment um, uh, in the global um, multilateral system. We've discussed yesterday already um, the role of the WTO, how the WTO is um, under threat, under attack, is being questioned. Um, by the coexistence of very different economic systems and, of course, the rise of China, the very different role of China um, that China plays compared to what it used to play um, 20 years ago when China was still a relatively small economy. And, of course, uh, due to the very new uh, U.S. administration that takes a very different view to what it used to take um, on uh, the value of the global multilateral system. Um, and I think um, the U.S. view certainly goes beyond pure trade questions. There is a clear change in strategy, as far as I read it, at least from here, uh, to say that um, the um, uh, multilateral system has not served U.S. interests well. On the contrary, it has helped uh, the rise of China as a rival instead of as a partner. And that is a clear shift um, in the U.S. strategy. And it has major implications for uh, the European trading uh, uh, the strategy, uh, but also more broadly the European geostrategic strategy. And um, therefore, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that we can discuss these topics here today. I couldn't think of a better keynote speaker to kick off our discussion this morning um, on, on all of these questions. Um, we are very honored and pleased to welcome Mr. Yuichi Otabe, who is the former Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary at the Mission of Japan to the European Union. Um, and, uh, uh, to, uh, to, Gen uh, to Geneva, of course, sorry, to Geneva. So I was just saying he was an ambassador in Geneva. Um, so he knows WTO uh, uh, issues up, upside, downside. But he was also, of course, and that's very important, um, uh, involved in the negotiations on the EU-Japan trade agreement. And as you may remember, the EU-Japan uh, trade negotiation was actually going on for many, many years. But then Mr. Trump uh, came into office and all of a sudden it went very quickly and we signed this agreement um, uh, in a very, very short period of time and as you know it's currently being, being ratified. Um, and so I think we will tremendously benefit from, from your insights um, this morning, Mr. Ambassador, on what made um, this Japan-EU agreement uh, happen, um, what are the key issues that you see for the global trading system uh, going forward, and where do you see the overall uh, landscape evolving. So, so please uh, join me in welcoming um, the Ambassador. Thank you so much for coming this morning, and we look forward to your keynote and opening remarks, followed by a few questions and then a panel discussion. Uh, good morning. Well, uh, I started to suffer from jet lag, so uh, I'm not sure whether I can make an impressive speech or not. Uh, anyway, uh, it's such a great honor and pleasure uh, to be here today 
It's not only uh, because of the invitation from the esteemed forum and the host institutions, uh, but because of the importance of this meeting at this uh, very critical moment uh, when the multilateral system is facing an unprecedented challenges today. I attended uh, three symposiums uh, recently, two at Washington DC, on the WTO, and on the multilateralism. You can easily imagine the very depressing atmosphere of uh, these uh, meetings. Whereas the one at Tokyo, which I attended, on the Japan-EU relationship, including the signing of the agreements, namely strategic partnership agreement and uh, economic partnership agreement, was carried out in a very, very positive mood. Likewise, I hope this meeting will send out a constructive and realistic message with wisdoms of uh, European and Asian participants. As for my contribution to this meeting, I'd like to share with you several points relating to trade. As escalating trade tensions already have adverse effects on global growth perspective, and even risk undermining the system. In recent weeks, the OECD and the IMF have respectively uh, published Interium Economic Outlook and World Economic Outlook, which many of you have already read. High uncertainty and rise of the downside risks are pronounced in these two outlooks. Among the various cause elements of the downward revision of the outlooks, uncertainty over trade policy is pronounced in the wake of U.S. actions and threatened action on several fronts, as well as the responses by other countries. Now, let me turn on to the specific point. First, the role of trade. As IMF Managing Director Madame Lagarde stated in Bali last week, trade has helped transform our world by boosting productivity, spreading new technologies, and making products more affordable. But trade alone cannot solve all issues unless more effective domestic policies, including scaled up investment in training and social uh, safe net be put in place to achieve strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth. Second, one of the root causes of the recent U.S. trade policy, trade imbalance. When I was much younger, I'm still young though, I was dealing with trade imbalance issue with the EC and the US. Lesson learned was that it should be the current account to be examined and that as it reflects each country macroeconomic saving investment balance, each country should take appropriate macroeconomic and structural policy to eliminate excessive global imbalance. This issue should be addressed not in a bilateral context, but in a multilateral context. And I welcome our finance ministers' discussions at their uh, meetings. Third, the role and the responsibilities of emerging economies. At the IMF, its member states have so-called voices according to their quotas. Among top 10 quota holding members, China, India, Brazil are there. Now the 15th General Review 
of quotas is underway for the alignment of quota share to result in increased shares for them. China will, I presume, have the second biggest voices after the United States. Quite in contrast, at the WTO, these economies still enjoy the status of developed members with the special and differentiated treatment accorded in the same manner as to the LDCs. In this regard, although I'm strongly against most of the recent U.S. trade policy and measures, I fully support Mr. Lighthizer when he stated at the WTO ministerial conference last year that we cannot sustain a situation in which new rules can only apply to the few and the others will be given a pass in the name of self-frame status. I support the view that developing country should be allowed the flexibility to meet their developing needs. However, flexibility should be made available to members who actually need. Fourth, the reform, modernization of the WTO. The WTO has been perceived as a cornerstone of the multilateral trading system with its three pillars functions, namely rule setting, monitoring of members' trade policy, and dispute settlement. All these three pillars are now being challenged. The WTO's negotiating arms have been paralyzed for some time. At the Nairobi Ministerial Conference in 2015, Japan, the United States, the EU, and other advanced members rejected to continue the DDA negotiation. So, at least for us, the Doha round is dead. The WTO quite often is criticized for being too slow in coming up with a solution to the new challenges. It should catch up with a real world development. In order to do so, we need flexibility in our negotiating approaches, such as prelateral agreement, soft law approaches, etc. On the monitoring law, the importance of full and effective implementation of the agreements cannot be overstated. Here, I'm not only accusing the United States. At the WTO, many members, including some big players, don't abide by the requirements regarding notification and transparency of their trade policy. By the way, this is another very few points in which I concur with the United States. On the dispute settlement, it is at grave danger. If the United States blockage of Appalachian body member appointment continues, it will undermine the system as a whole. Unlike a domestic legal system, international laws quite often lack effective enforcement mechanism. Without means of settling disputes, the rule-based system will be less effective as obligation under the agreement could not be enforced. There seems to be two types of issue, some of rather philosophical nature and others of technical uh, nature. I have no intention to go into the details today, but I'd like to appeal strongly that quick action by members are called for to preserve the system. Fifth, I'd like to touch upon the so-called mega FTAs. 
Against the backdrop of the stalemate situation of the WTO Doha round negotiation, as I have mentioned, we have witnessed the mushrooming increases of the FTAs around the globe, giving rise to the concerns expressed as spaghetti ball effects. The mega FTA should not be a spaghetti plate. Given the highly ambitious content, I strongly hope they will constitute the basic layers as lasagna in the trading system architecture. As a trade mafia, I'm fully aware of the technical and political difficulties involved, for example, in such area as rules of origin and GI, GIs. If we are to expand these mega FDAs to include other uh, countries. At the same time, giving a glance at Japan EU EPA uh, text, I found many points which we can and should translate into the multilateral context. To cite a few, the negative list approach in trading services, cooperation in regulatory field, strengthen government procurement disciplines should be important elements in the future plurilateral or multilateral agreements. Six, on the Brexit. As not only uh, Japanese, but many foreign uh, companies are carrying out their uh, activities in Europe with the very complex supply chain system, making full use of the merit of the integrated market in Europe. Therefore, predictability and stability are highly needed in agreement between Brussels and London on transition period. No deal, in other words, hard Brexit will inevitably pose another serious risks even to the world economy. I strongly hope the European wisdom can overcome the present difficulties. Regarding Brexit, another important issue not generally perceived is its implication in the WTO or context. UK will be an independent member. Its, its contribution to the organization is highly expected for. Having said that, necessary consultation and negotiation will have to be carried out and completed in Geneva regarding UK's concession and its membership to the government procurement agreement. Here again, flexible and constructive approach with full transparency is strongly called for. To conclude my remark, we are entering a new economic era with the more than anticipated rapid developments of global and regional value change. It demands new thinking, not a mercantilist thinking. And as my friend, Mr. Azevedo, the WTO DG appears, in face of the crisis to the trading system, we can't just cross our arms. We need everybody who believes in trade and the trading system, although not perfect, as a force for good to stand up for it and speak up for it. We need to explore every possible avenues. And in doing so, I wish the spirit of Sir Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, who wrote, you cannot always get what you want, and that of Sir Paul McCartney, who said, we can work it out, be fully shared by all. Thank you.
much. Thank you. So can I ask my my panelists to come on stage already so that we Yeah. Or is there any is there yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so thank, thank you, Ambassador, so much for, uh, for your insights and your wisdom. Um, I think on the, same, uh, on the same topic, we will continue basically this discussion. We call our panel Asia-Europe Leadership on the Global Stage. And uh, I'm very pleased to welcome um, three distinguished speakers. We start uh, on my left, Mr. Uh, Rintaro Tamaki. He's the CEO of the Japan Center for International Finance and was, of course, um, um, uh, at the OECD as well as Deputy Minister um, in the Finance Ministry of Japan. So welcome. Um, uh, then further to my left, Mr. Je Sung Lee. He's Professor and Jean Monnet Chair um, at Korea University and will give a Korean perspective, but I guess as a Jean Monnet share, he also knows quite a bit about Europe. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, Jean pisani uh, who's professor at Sciences Po and senior fellow uh, here at Bruegel. So, so welcome to all three of you. And we want to make this as interactive as possible. So, so, so perhaps I start by, by asking Mr. Mr. Tamaki on, on my left to um, introduce his thinking on global leadership, Europe, Asia, Europe, global leadership, um, what, what is next? I mean, we have agreed on an EU-Japan trade agreement, which ho hopefully will be ratified, but what will come next? What is the strategy? Thank you. Thank you, Guntram. Um, Mr. Otabe described himself as trade mafia. Mr. Otabe described himself as trade mafia. I am currency mafia. <laughs> and currency ma mafias has a very strict discipline not to invade other mafias territory. <laughs> so I should refrain from commenting on each of the technicalities that he mentioned. But uh, overall, this agreement, Japan-EU trade agreement, was one of the most striking achievements by both sides, particularly for the current administration of Japan. The, in discussing collaboration between Asia, in my case Japan, and uh, Europe, trade is a quite natural area to collaborate. But others, other areas are also wonderful candidates of collaboration. If I say something, um, perhaps on uh, sustainability issues, 